My name is Simeon Franklin. I'm a longtime software developer. I've done uh, mostly Python and Django stuff for the last mm, five or six years, but uh, I quit being an honest developer about a year ago and started to work full time for a company called Maracana. So I, uh, I now train for a living. I teach people uh, Python and Django and uh, occasionally bits and pieces of JavaScript, mostly as uh, penance for my sins. Um, but I've been lots of interesting places, talked to lots of interesting developers. I was at Facebook last week, been to Intel and Cisco and Motorola and um, Qualcomm, you name it, been there. Um, and if you're interested in the stuff that I'm interested in, hey, follow me on Twitter, at Simeon Franklin, hit up my blog. Uh, I write there irregularly. Come find me in the Python community. Um, SF Python meetup in uh, SF is a lot of fun. We meet at Yelp. Uh, there's beer and pizza and interesting speakers, or come down to uh, Bay Piggies in the South Bay, if that floats your boat. And uh, I sometimes go to the Django meetup in SF as well. Don't organize that one. Um, but you know, you might catch me there from time to time. And uh, remind me, at the end of the talk, to talk more about the wonderful Python community. So this talk. Um, so I aimed it for a novice audience, for people that don't have experience with Django. And I'm hoping to like, let you feel like you understand an overview of how Django works, the minimum number of like, concepts and terminology you need to write web applications with Django. Uh, I want to show you some of my favorite third-party Django apps. That turns out to be a lot of uh, what acquiring experience with Django involves. And then just close off with, if you're experienced with Django, you know some Python, and you're bored with the first two-thirds of the talks, we'll talk about some advanced Python language features that you ought to be using and how you could use them with Django. And uh, you know, throw some code on the board and see if there's anything that makes us stop and think a little bit. And uh, I have no idea how I'm going to do on time here, so I may, I may race or jump ahead, or I may end with 20 minutes for Q&A. And uh, that would be awesome. Just in terms of the talk in general, feel free to ask questions. You can interrupt me. That's right. If you don't understand something, if I'm going too fast, raise your hand, throw something in my general direction. I might throw it back at you. Just uh, you know, no heckling. So let's talk about, let's talk about Django. Uh, Django is a web application framework. I need to talk about what that means exactly, but it's been around for a while. It was first released in 2005. It's kind of a, a project that was abstracted from a particular web application made for a newspaper in uh, Lawrence, Kansas. And it had some immediate popularity. It just, it just hit things exactly right. A web framework written in Python. Um, Ruby on Rails was hugely, becoming hugely popular right at that time, and Django is kind of Python's answer to Ruby on Rails. So tons of development activity, tons of uh, revisions, it didn't have kind of a good formal release cycle until 1.0 in 2008, three years later. But it had tons of community participation. And uh, Django 1.0 is kind of more or less modern Django. Uh, it just released 1.5 earlier this year. And Django is kind of on a six-month release schedule. They promised to come out with a new version every six months. As a matter of fact, they always slip by a few weeks. But the, uh, the release cycle has been, uh, been good for us. Uh, so it's a web framework. It's kind of the same space as competitors. Patricia mentioned like Ruby on Rails, or maybe you've heard of uh, Pyramid, or Node.js and JavaScript, or, or other Python things like Flask, um, PHP stuff, Cake PHP, Code Igniter. Uh, just the general space is to write, quickly write, web applications that are backed by a database. And uh, Django, I'm not sure how to convey its popularity. Um, it's been successfully used on really large projects, so discuss the internet uh, commenting framework. You can have discuss comments you know, on your blog. It's a huge site, huge traffic site. Uh, has been written in, in Django forever. David Kramer, the, uh, the discuss guy, has uh, contributed a lot of performance stuff to Django core. Um, Pinterest, maybe you know about Pinterest. Tons of pictures, uh, a social media around pictures site. Um, the Onion, various parts of Mozilla.org that have to do with collecting data back from the millions of Firefox browsers. So Django's been used for lots of large and successful projects. Um, as far as numbers, like if you look at PyPy, which is the way you can automatically install Python packages, uh, Django version 1.5 had um, 50,000 plus downloads, and it was released in February. So it's being actively used. There's a site called DjangoSites.org that's supposed to list a lot of sites that use Django. It has 4,200 sites listed. I can promise you it's not exhaustive because like, I've written 100 sites that aren't on there at all. Um, but it's, it's widely used. I, I did think I'd try some Google Trends to show Django being popular, but um, screw you, Django Unchained. You just totally messed up our search keywords. So this graph is completely meaningless. Pay no attention to it at all. Um, but, but it is popular. It is widely used. It, it is kind of beloved in the Python community. Why Django? Why might you pick Django? Um, it's interesting. One of the reasons 
to use Django um, might be a reason that frustrates you a little bit. Django is a project that has paid a lot of attention to documentation from day one. The guys that started it right, uh, worked for a newspaper. Uh, some of them had English degrees instead of CS degrees. They were around writers. They valued um, good, clear, thorough, comprehensive documentation. So Django had great docs. It still does. There's a lot of them, you might have noticed. Um, another reason to pick Django is Python. So if you're like me, you love the Python programming language. Maybe you have a half a dozen languages to compare it to. Maybe it's your first programming language, but I can assure you, Python um, programming Python makes me happy. Happier than, happier than C, C++, Java, Perl, most other stuff that I've written code in Anger, Visual Basic, way back when, Delphi. I got lots of old uh, musty language rattling around in my brain. But kind of the other reason for Django, the why Django question is, Django's a full stack framework. Or you might say it's batteries included. So Django does like everything, almost. Lots of uh, competitors in this space are frameworks that aim to provide you uh, a minimal core that you'll extend to do your thing. Django tries to give you tools to do everything you could possibly want to do. It does a really good job at that. It turns out that it's not enough, and we'll uh, look at that in a little bit. But Django just kind of hits the sweet spot um, for the typical kind of database-backed web applications that kind of make up 80% of the web applications people have written for the last, uh, the last half a decade or so. Makes a lot of that stuff uh, easier, faster. You can check out the docs. Uh, you've probably been to docs.djangoproject.com. Take a look at the front page. There's a lot of links. And if you're going to be a Django developer, yeah, you kind of have to read all those links on the front page. Um, it's good docs. They're comprehensive. They're, they're well organized. There's tables of contents. There's a good search engine. Um, and really, the whole framework is documented. There aren't very many undocumented bits and pieces uh, laying about. And it's traditionally had a tutorial which is most people's uh, first exposure to Django. So quick show of hands, who's done the Django tutorial? Did you do it for version 1.5 out of curiosity? So now it has like five sections and some extra sections. OK, the latest version, maybe. Um, so do start with the tutorial. That's, that's still good advice. Go take the Django tutorial. It'll walk you through some basic concepts. Um, especially it, up to version 1.5, it did some dumb things that I think make it harder for you uh, getting started. And I'm uh, hoping in this talk just to give you a different introduction to Django, uh, the, the basic moving pieces that you need to know. I still do the tutorial if you haven't, but uh, it might go better after this talk. So let's just look at the fundamental, like the concepts, the terminology you need to master to write web applications with Django. And we'll do that with a really, really basic web application. So. You want to build a web application with Django. What does that look like? Might look like Pinterest. People have been there, right? Big front page with lots of pictures. People make accounts. People pin their favorite pictures. You can follow people and see the things that they pinned. There's lots of data flowing around, lots of dynamic data. Or you know, maybe your interest is Reddit, another social networking site. Pretty much oriented around, I'll, I'll post a comment or I'll post a link to an article and then everybody will comment. Maybe you'll vote me up if my comments are particularly insightful. Um, it's almost like a, a game, right? Acquiring some score. But again, there's lots of data. There's people, relationships, points, articles, comments, lots of data floating around. So those are two really different projects, but they're both kind of the sort of thing that you might try and do with Django. They're HTML interfaces to highly dynamic data with a relational database backend. And it's the kind of thing that, um, that Django's really good at. So what do you have to know to write the next Pinterest? Well, it's going to be more than this. But uh, let's start with this. So the first bit is just uh, that Django is going to be HTTP in and HTTP out. It's going to hide that from you a little bit, but you're going to need to understand that. So the, uh, the diagram here has HTTP requests and HTTP responses. And Django is the stuff in yellow. The minimum that you need to know to write a web application is uh, you need to know about URLs. URLs in Django are basically how you say, hey, uh, the request that's coming in, where should it go? And you pick something. You've got to know about views. Views are going to be the Python callables that actually return a response. And if you have a really basic web application, your view might only use models to talk to the database and templates to produce some HTML. So let's see if we can understand like this much and, again, write a really simple, trivial web app with that amount of understanding. 
um, I'm going to kind of wave my hands at the installation section, go see the documentation. But if you know Python tools, you can make a virtual environment. You could use pip to install Django. And then there's a couple of concepts you need to know once you have Django actually installed. Uh, the first concept is a project. So your web application, just let's call that a project. The web application is a project, and Django comes with a tool to create a project for you, kind of a blank, empty skeleton of a project. So once you have Django installed, you can type a command called django-admin.py. And it takes subcommands, and the subcommand that you're interested in at the moment is called start project. And you can give your project whatever name you like, um, as long as it's a valid Python identifier. So don't go crazy with spaces or weird characters. Stick to alphanumeric and underscore. So I said Django admin start project story time. And then just to see what files I got, I got a new directory called story time. I've got some settings, URLs, and a manage.py in there. Um, there's a couple of other files we pretty much don't have to pay attention to. There's a whiskey file. That's kind of about your deployment. And there's an init file. Uh, Pythonia says, what's the init file there for? The file that says underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore, dot py. Make it like a there you go. So that file's empty. Its size is zero. It has no code. But that's the special file Python looks at to say, can I import this directory as a module or not? So a little Python thing there. So what does a project have fundamentally that we're interested in? The main thing it has is settings. So the settings.py basically says, like, OK, which project is this? Maybe things like what database are you going to talk to? Or who are the users who can use it? And what, um, what all the configuration details for your particular application are? There's a manage.py file there. Uh, you won't ever edit, edit the manage.py file. It's just a command runner. It's to do things in the context of your project. You will be editing that settings. And then there's a urls.py file. And this is your starting point to configure your URLs, which is the very first thing that you need to do. Is everybody with me so far? I ran Django admin. I started a project. I haven't edited any files whatsoever yet. I have a directory full of Python files. I didn't create them. They've got lots of sensible defaults and comments. Um, we can use that manage py file to then run commands from now on. You could still use Django admin, but manage py knows what, uh, what project it's in. So the convention is python manage.py and then some kind of command. Um, the first command I want to try out is run server. And run server is a development web server. It's not something you should use in, in uh, production, but it does let you point your web browser at your own IP and some weird port. It's usually 8,000 by default. You can customize that if you want and see a web page if you have a web page. So did we make a web page? Well, sort of. It works. Congratulations on your first Django-powered page. We haven't done anything yet except successfully install the framework. So it has some helpful comments. If you plan to use a database, edit the database settings in your settings.py. You're probably going to need an app. So run Python manage py start app and then some app name. Let's do those things and see what we get. So another fundamental piece of terminology. Web applications in Django are projects. And then projects have applications inside them. And you actually have a bunch of applications for free from Django. And all the development work that you're going to do mostly is going to live inside of applications. So how could I make an application? You might expect from the experience making a project. There's a command for that. So again, I can run Python manage py. And the command I'm interested in is start app. And start app takes an application name, and I'm going to call my application story. So I still haven't edited any code at all, just generating code with these tools. And I get a few more files. Um, again, just using the find command to show uh, the new directory story that was created inside of my project, and a couple of files inside it. I have a views.py. There's that init again. You can just kind of ignore that. It makes it a module. Tests and models. The, uh, the start page that we got before when we started up also helpfully said, hey, you need to go edit your settings file, and you need to specify a database. So I said, you know, database-backed web applications. Y you don't have to use a database to use Django. But it takes a lot of the point out of it if you're not going to use a uh, data store. So SQLite is a little toy database. The drivers come with Python, so it's a favorite, favorite to use for, uh, for demos. It's, um, it's not really a database server. It's a little you know, database in a file. You can think like Microsoft Access or uh, FoxPro if you have experience with any of those technologies. Um, don't use it on production. It's, it's not multi-user. Um, 
it's reasonably fast and we can use it to do our little development work. So I changed my settings file and said two things. The engine that I want to use is django.db.backends.sqlite3. And how did I know that particular string? They helpfully left a comment with the, uh, the possible options I could put there. And then the name, and in this case, the name is just going to be a file that will be in the current directory. For backends, I could have chose, chosen a lot of other database backends. Again, there's a comment suggesting the other options, but whatever your database uh, preference is, if you've got one, Django supports it. So MySQL, PostgreSQL, MSSQL, Oracle, whatever. It'll hook up to, uh, hook up to all of them with uh, only slightly varying degrees of support. The other thing I needed to do is what you're going to get used to doing every time you add an app. I need to edit my installed apps directive. So this is also in my settings.py. And I just added the little line at the bottom that says story. There's a list of the Python import paths to Python modules that are not just Python modules. They're also Django applications. And hey, story is the one I just made. Story is in there. Just needed to add that. And I'm on to the fundamental concepts we got to know about. So URLs, views, models, templates. OK, so URLs. The first one, fundamental concept number one. This is just the part after the domain, right? You go someplace, you've got a domain, and then you've also got like the bit in red here, foo. And all web frameworks are pretty much a way to say, well, if somebody goes to the path foo, what part of your code should I call in response, right? Django's way of uh, handling that is to have us write regular expressions that match a path that's coming in and then include the view that should go along with that particular regular expression. So this is the default urls.py, and it has a couple of comments. Uh, it says you could write URLs that look like, and then it's kind of hard to read strings, an R and a, a caret, story time, and a slash. It kind of sucks, actually, especially for beginners. Like Again, quick show of hands, uh, who feels really um, happy with their regex foo in whatever language? can do it. <laughs> Nobody feels happy, right? <laughs> so Jamie Zawinski quote, I think. I know I have a, I have a problem. I know I use regexes. Now I have two problems. Um, so it kind of sucks. So the first thing you have to do is figure out regular expressions. And regular expressions are a mini language for matching patterns. And you probably know a little bit about it. Every character, more or less, is significant. Um, you know, why do I have to learn this right away? One reason is regexes are fast, and they're really flexible. If, uh, if, like the Django guys, you started in a PHP and Apache world, this just seems like the sensible way to do things. You're used to writing regexes that map to paths for uh, like mod rewrite in Apache. So it just seems like the obvious way to do it. It's, it's not painful for you. You don't know why it should be painful for anybody else. And I'll just say for the beginner, fortunately for you, you can start out by copying and pasting. So for us, we're just going to write a single URL and see if we understand the rule. So this is my urls.py. It was automatically generated um, by the start project. And I went in and just put one line of code. It had some comments. I deleted the comments. I put in one line of code. And that's the bit in the middle that starts with URL. And let's, uh, let's understand this character by character. So Python knowledge, actually. I've got a little piece of code there. What's the R for? Anybody know? So it's not a regex. The R thing is Python. And it's telling Python that I'm going to type a string. And you shouldn't interpret any of the characters inside the string. So if you make a string in Python normally and you have slash n, Python says you don't want a slash and then an n. You want a single new line character, right? It does a little bit of uh, character magic for you. So a bunch of things like that. The raw string, Python isn't going to do any string interpolation on at all. And since regexes are full of weird and wacky punctuation, it's common to write them with raw strings to make sure that the string you get is the string you typed. OK, so that's the R. And then anybody who does know regexes, what's caret and then dollar sign mean? Uh, start with that average. Right, so caret is the special syntactical start here in regexes, matching a string. And dollar is the special end here. And I've got nothing between them, so I've written a beautiful magical regex. It's two characters that basically means I didn't get a path. I got nothing. Um, the next thing in my URL statement is a import path to a Django view. And we don't know what a view is yet, so we'll talk about that in a second. For the moment, I'll just say it's a Python callable. And then the last bit is a name. Django lets us name our URLs. Naming our URLs is really cool, because later on, 
instead of hard coding whatever the particular path might be someplace, you can just say, hey, figure out the path that corresponds to the URL called home. It's good practice to get into. Name all your URLs. And as usual, hey, you could go read the Django docs. They're excellent. They're comprehensive. There's links in the slides. I'll post a slide so you can go to the right spot. OK, URLs, did everybody get that? We just we said, hey, if you don't have a path, go someplace to something. Not too much yet, right? OK, so views, fundamental concept number two that we need to understand. Uh, a view is Python code that takes a request object and returns a response object. That sounds a lot like what Django does in general. You can write views a bunch of different ways. But let's write a really simple one, um, a Python callable. Well. One kind of Python callable would be a function. It takes a request object, so that's just a parameter to my function, and it has to return a response, an HTTP response. I have no idea how to make an HTTP response. Unfortunately, Django has an HTTP library that will let me give it a string, and it'll make an HTTP response, which is a, a bigger thing that's got lots of, uh, lots of headers and pieces of data about the response. So this is a Django view. Pretty simple, right? Just a function, takes a request, returns a response, and the response says, Hello world. Sweet. We build a web app, right? You go to n no particular place, you know, kind of just the domain itself, and you see hello world. It works. We don't have any HTML yet. And that's part of what we want to do with web apps. So concept number three that you got to know is templates. And especially when you get started, you might spend a lot of your time uh, knowing and understanding templates. We want to make a web application. We better build a response that's got some HTML in it. And so there's a common use case here. Um, your application probably has a bunch of HTML that doesn't change, right? You've got like a header and a footer and a menu. And then you've got some HTML that does change a lot, You know, kind of the middle part of your page. Maybe it's Pinterest and you're showing pictures. Maybe it's Reddit and you're showing stories and comments. Most web frameworks include template engines, and they try to let us manage all this HTML in kind of some common ways. Basically, we can put HTML and then some placeholders. And the placeholders might be code. And we're probably not lucky enough to be able to code in whatever language it is that we're adding the framework in in the first place. So yay, we get to learn a whole other tiny little programming language. But basically, just a way for us to deal with big chunks of HTML in a bunch of separate files and hopefully produce an HTML interface. So let's look at Django support for templates. Um, I'm going to make a directory in my application. I just happen to know that if you make a directory called templates in your application and you put templates there, Django will magically be able to find it. I could be more explicit. I could go edit my settings and tell it, hey, my templates are stored over here. But for the moment, I'm taking advantage of this built-in behavior. So I made a directory called templates and a subdirectory called story. If you know about Django, um, you know why I did this. If you don't, maybe we'll get to in the QA uh, session explaining why I repeated myself. But I'm going to make a template and call it base.html. So let's make a really minimal base.html template. It's almost all just plain old HTML. And it's like the simplest possible. I guess this is an HTML5 page because it doesn't have a doc type. Simplest possible page I could make. It should all look really familiar if you've ever looked at HTML before, except for the middle bit that has brackets and percents and says block content and end block. So Django comes with a templating language. The templating language is what makes our templates not just static content, but dynamic. Something's going to happen there in the block. It provides uh, a few fundamental concepts, tags, filters, and pretty much just output, the ability to say, print this variable. Uh, block is a Django template tag. So what does block do for me? I got to do one more thing. I want to make a second template, same directory. It's in my story templates story directory, and it's called home.html. And this is what home.html looks like. The first line says extends story base HTML. It's got a block again. And then the thing in the middle where there's two braces is basically the print statement. So I'm just going to print out some variable hello. I don't know where that comes from yet. It's kind of cool is the extends block is how Django does uh, template inheritance which is the idea that every little template I make doesn't need to have the whole site design in it. I'll keep that all in the base template. The base template won't change very much. And this is the template specific to a specific page of my application. It extends the base template 
And the way Django's extension works is you have name blocks. If the child template has the same name block as exists in the parent template, the stuff in the child template shows up in the parent template. So I have a block content here. I had a block content in my base. Hopefully, whatever hello is is going to end up in my base. Everybody still with me? Am I going at a good speed? Nothing too complicated yet. OK, and hello is going to output a variable that needs to be passed by the view. So gee, that means I get to go back and fix my view. Um, in this case, I'm going to import from Django.shortcuts a function called render to response. So this is one of those Django things. The tutorial will walk you through um, ways to get lots of things accomplished. And uh, Django knots will frequently get frustrated with the long way to get things done and write a cool, quick, and short way to get stuff done and stuff it in the shortcuts module. So you're going to want to know about everything that's in the shortcuts module eventually. Render to response basically says, well, I know that you want to make an HTTP response. And I know that you want to do it with a template library. So if you gave me a dictionary of variable names and values and a template, I'd be in charge of putting those two things together, making an HTTP response out of the resulting string, and returning that back out of the view. So here I am with my render to response. I'm telling it, hello is a variable. It's just a string. Its contents are hello world. If you've done a little bit of Python, you'll notice I'm just making a little dictionary in line here. And that's going to render my home template. And if everything worked out well, I'm back to my web app. So welcome to story time. Hello world. You know, we got real HTML now. It's, a, it's actually a web app. So you're going to have to learn a bunch about templates. Um, tags and filters. And don't worry, because they're really easy. It's just that there's a bunch of them. I've got links to the docs here, to the templates page, and also uh, the reference to the built-in tags and filters. There's tags and filters to do everything from logical operations like looping and if inside your HTML to doing string formatting, things like um, saying Facebook style dates. You know, you give it a date time and it says, oh, about three days ago. You know, lots of stuff for doing content manipulation. Um, none of it is particularly complicated or exotic, but it turns out writing Django web apps, a lot of the programming that you're going to do is in the template language in the templates. So one more concept here. Fundamental concept number four is models. We have a web app. It says hello inside of a bunch of HTML, generated by Python code. But there isn't any like dynamic data, right? We're not talking to the database yet. So that's what my models are for. Um, this is supposed to be a database-backed web app. And we're going to need to create and read and update and delete all that good CRUD stuff, uh, data from a relational database. And again, you can kind of say, so I don't know what relational database I should use. I don't know SQL that well. I don't even know what SQL means. Uh, that's OK. Hopefully, we're going to be able to work with just Python code. And uh, until we really have to, Django is going to obscure some of the complicated details from us. Um, but don't worry. When you really need to get down to the raw SQL, you can totally do that with Django. Um, basically, all you need to know is that models are database tables represented in Python code as Python classes. So models are your handle to create the table in your database automatically to generate the SQL that you need to update the table in your database. So query it to get data out, put new data in, update or delete stuff that's already there. And you might sometimes hear the term thrown out, ORM. It's an object relational mapper. That's basically the category that Django's uh, model implementation falls into. And pretty much you just need to know a model that we'll show you in a minute is a database table an instance of a model, you make little objects from classes. An instance of a model basically corresponds to a database row. So here's a model. It's really simple. This is in my models.py. Uh, the models.py was generated automatically for me. Um, it didn't have any code in it. Just a helpful comment. Put your models here. So I actually, I think it had the import statement in it. But I made a class called line. Line inherits from models.model. And line has one class level attribute called text, which is an instance of a models.char field. So this is how a lot of stuff in Django works, actually. You write this declarative class that has class level attributes. And there's some kind of relationship going on here. My class is a model, and it's got individual attributes that are model subclasses somehow or other. They're related. Um, basically, all the, all the fields, all the field types correspond to database columns. So I'm making a text field that can store up to 255 characters here. How could I use it? Um, 
it's worth noting that there's database stuff going on behind the scenes. I didn't specify like a primary key on my table, and if you know relational databases, you know I probably should have. It's okay. You don't have to do that. Django will notice that I didn't and automatically give me an, an ID auto number primary key sort of field behind the scenes. Uh, how could I create the tables? You're probably used to it by this time. There's a management command for that. So I run python manage.py syncdb, and it runs through creating tables. So it's generating the appropriate SQL for my back end. How do you create tables on SQLite? I don't know off the top of my head, actually. I know like MySQL and Postgres better. I don't know if I could type out an SQL create table statement without error in SQLite. But that's OK, because Django's going to do that for me. And you might notice the very bottom one down there at the bottom, creating a bunch of tables, stuff that comes built in with Django. But the bottom one says creating table story underscore line. That's the table that corresponds to the model that I just made. So now that I've got my database created, I could try just using the model's API, like in the interactive Python shell. Um, I'll hold off the question about the interactive Python shell for a moment. You probably used it, right? You can just type Python normally, and you get a little prompt. It's got three errors. You can type Python code and hit Enter. It executes right away. You really ought to be using IPython. We'll talk about that. Um, I can't just say Python in the context of Django. If I want to talk to my models, they need to know like which project they're in, so they know which database to talk to. So there's a management command to launch the Python prompt. Python manage py shell starts up a Python shell with the Django environment kind of configured for me. And then I can say from story.models import line, that's the class I made. Just kind of looks like normal Python. And things like line text equals, that looks like I'm instantiating a class, right? You call a class in Python to make an instance of it. And I'm getting back line, which is a Python object. When I call line.save, that Python object knows what database table its attribute should be stored in and how to get them there. It's generating the SQL update statement for me. So that's all the Python code it takes to create a new row of uh, data in my database table. And I could also like run a query. I could say line.objects.all. And that's behind the scenes creating a select star from whatever my table name is, getting all the data back. And I get back a thing that kind of looks like a list. Um, it's a query set. It's a really cool object. If you get a little past beginning Django, you'll spend a lot of time playing with query sets. So let's update our view again and see if we've got to a database-backed web application yet. Um, the only additional thing I need to do is from models import line. So get the, the model that I made. And my view now is going to return a dictionary again. It's got a key called lines. And the value is line.objects.all. So that's going to be all the lines I've got in the database. Headed out to the template which also had to get updated. I think I mentioned you're going to have to do some programming in the template. Um, I still have the block content thing. I've got a tag for an unordered list. I think I left off the closing unordered list tag. That's really horrible. I've got some Django template programming in the middle, like four line in lines. It's pretty much a Python for loop stuffed in my HTML. Yeah, you got to go look at the docs for the, uh, for the template tags. Four is a built-in template tag. And here's another template tag. It's called cycle. Anybody want to guess what cycle does? Shoot. Maybe alternate between those two colors if every line that it brings up? Indefinitely. It's going to give me one or the other back. Uh, does anybody know about the Python built-in that does that? So you should definitely check out the iter tools module in Python. There's lots of cool things around iteration. And there's iterTools.cycle that does the same thing. You give it a list, and it gives you items from the list. And when it reaches the end, it goes back to the beginning. So it's an infinitely long list that you can consume and like repeat some pieces of data. OK, and then I think we said before, a couple of braces. That's more or less the way you say print this thing. And in this case, this thing isn't a string. It's an instance of my line class. And instances of my line class have a text attribute. So if everything worked out well, yeah, I have a, an actual real web application. It's pulling some data from the database, showing it on the page in some HTML. OK, URLs views, templates, and models. See the docs as usual, how to define your models. There's a lot of complicated uh, issues there that we're totally going to punt on tonight. And how to make queries. You can make cool and complicated queries uh, with the Django ORM. And again, we're going to totally punt on that unless you have questions in the Q&A period. Let me show you one more thing in the little app that I'm making. There's an admin app that comes with Django. It's sort of a selling point for Django, just for free, more or less. I can uncomment a couple lines in my URLs couple lines in the settings, and add an admin.py file to my application that looks like this. 
pretty much just one line of configuration. I'm telling the admin app, hey, I've got this class line. You really ought to, I don't know, do something with it. And for free, you get a, mm, a CRUD interface to your data. You can go edit. I can go edit lines, add new lines. And if I add new lines, then the lines would show up on the page. And I started doing this because my third grade daughter keeps on bringing me stories that she writes with her classmates. Everybody writes one line, they pass the paper down, right? And uh, you know, there once was a girl who had a blue hat. Suddenly, a dragon jumped out. You can always tell like when she's sitting next to a boy by her stories. OK, so you wrote your first web app. You're on your way to Facebook or Pinterest, right? Uh, no. So you need ever so much more than just that, just like the fundamental concepts. And Django actually comes with a ton more. So there's a ton of shortcuts to use in views. There's forms. We haven't talked about that, how we can uh, accept data and validate it from the user. There's model forms to automatically make forms based on our models. There's managers and complicated queries. There's a caching framework built in. There's logging. There's like a bunch of stuff that I'm not even going to say, everything. Just a ton of stuff that you have to know about in Django. Management commands. Geo Django. There's a whole section for doing GIS stuff that I actually don't know enough about. And it's weird, but all that, and it's still not enough. So Django is this huge framework. There's a ton of batteries included. If you went and downloaded the docs as a PDF, it's like up to 1,200 pages now. Fortunately, like 400 of that is Geo Django, which you can uh, mostly ignore. But there's a lot you have to know about, and it turns out it's not enough for writing modern web applications. So kind of a fundamental thing you do after you take the tutorial is you say, I need some more pieces. What pieces do I need? And it turns out other people have written the pieces that you need. Third-party applications are a fundamental piece of Django. The framework is made to make it easy to compose your project out of lots of apps. So you're going to use lots of third-party apps. Everybody does it. They'll supply missing pieces or maybe even just have like pre-built functionality that's exactly the thing that you need for your project. I'm just going to run you through a quick list without too much explanation of my like top 10 apps. And I'm not kidding when I say I could totally do a top 20 Django projects frequently. You start, and then you install a bunch of favorite apps because you know you're going to need them. Um, and I should just mention tools. If you don't know like how to use virtual env and pip to install stuff, that's just kind of fundamental Python knowledge. Um, so you should learn about that. Virtual env is built into Python 3.3. But uh, in earlier versions of Python, you're stuck kind of figuring it out on your own. Um, when you, if we get to talk about deployment, you should be using Fabric. Real easy. And uh, also for your interactive console, just use IPython already. That's a different talk, but you, sh you should check it out. Um, so my top 10 apps. So this is the stuff you, you probably will need, bits and pieces of this for your project. Uh, database migrations. And this is actually coming uh, soon to Django Contrib. Andrew Godwin just had a Kickstarter fundraiser. So he needed like $5,000 to work on it for a couple of months and move it into the Django project proper. And he raised $20,000. Uh, what database migrations do for you is you can go change the Python code for your models. And it'll automatically update your database to match your Python code. And you don't actually need this feature if you promise you'll never, ever change your models in your project. Uh, Django Debug Toolbar, got to have this. Um, it pretty much answers the question like, OK, what is going on on this page? What view? What templates? What SQL queries? What variables? Django doesn't help me very much. If I start up somebody else's complicated project and see the front page, I just have no idea how I got there. So the Debug Toolbar gives me a little HTML interface over on the side that tells me, actually, all those pieces of information, how much time it took to build the page, how many SQL queries got fired off, what templates, what variables the templates could see. If you haven't used a debug toolbar, kick yourself once and then go install it. It's totally indispensable. I'm, I'm lost and confused without it. Um, Django Extras is a favor, favorite developer goodies app that I frequently install. It's got management commands that uh, make management commands. That's not a joke. It's useful. You can graph all your models. Um, Use Shell Plus or Run Server Plus to give you cooler shells and a cooler development server. Crispy Forms and Floppy Forms basically gives you HTML5 form components, like client-side validation for free, bootstrap compatible output. It's basically like beautiful, gorgeous forms with no effort on your part. And yes, I cheated. That's two apps in one bullet point. But you need both of them. Uh, Haystack is a favorite of mine. It's an API to search engines. And we're talking search engines that you install on your server that search your data and let you do things like offer a search box for your data. Or if you liked this, maybe you'd like this other stuff. Or you searched for, so here's the page with the thing you searched for highlighted. That's really cool functionality. Haystack makes it easy to do that kind of thing. Uh, TastyPy makes it easy to make a RESTful API for your Django models. 
a little bit of configuration, and you get a big tree of JSON data, some pre-built views that'll let you even edit that data automatically if you like. And if you're used to writing JavaScript in the client, you're going to totally need TastyPy. Or, or maybe you're going to write an Android app or a, an iPhone app for your website. It's going to need to get data somehow. Or you just want to give other people an API for your site. Let them write a, a cron job that fetches data. TastyPy makes that sort of thing really trivial. Um, I did connect to the server, but or to the uh, wireless. Well, if you go look at my talk when I post the slides, this is linking to YouTube. I've got a video for Celery, which is huge. I can't explain it. You'll know when you want it. And uh, there's, a, there's a five minute video that I just totally couldn't cram in here to go take a look at Celery. Um, e some easier applications, like stuff that you'll want just right away. Easy thumbnails, you gotta deal with images. Easy thumbnails lets you resize stuff in, in template tags. So you can say, hey, they uploaded this gigantic image, resize it to 200 pixels by 200 pixels and keep the resize version around. Um, Jenga reversion, give yourself an undo, unlimited undo on your models. People make an edit, you don't like it, you can go back to the previous version. Everybody uses uh, revision control software for your code, right? And it's really useful. Now you can have that for your data too in your Django project. And you might check out Django Grappelli, which is my favorite, like prettier admin skin. And it's not just pretty, it lets you make a custom da dashboard and arrange things the way you like it. And gives you um, things like you can drag and drop the order of, of records in the admin and it will update the, uh, the database or autocomplete lookups. You start typing and it figures out what it is that you're looking for. Um, lots of cool handy stuff for the admin. And, so I'm, I'm flying past some apps that I use. Just to kind of give you the idea, Django has tons of high quality apps. And, and some of them are totally just to provide you with pre-built functionality. You need to register users, great, there's an app for that. Make appointments, create menus, on and on and on. There's an app for everything. And that's kind of one of the fundamental, like, why Django? So the zen of Django is you have an idea, and it's not, it's not your fundamental idea, it's not your whole application, but it's a little piece of it, great, make an app for that. And by the way, make an app and share it with me. Make it redistributable, I want to use your app. Uh, but if you do that, you should, make it, uh, you should make it Pythonic and you should make it whatever the, the heck you're supposed to use to say it looks like Django. I don't know what the, uh, I don't know what the right word is exactly. And that's sometimes like a tiny bit complicated. So, Django isn't magical, but if you're not an experienced Python dev, it can look a little magical. It does use some advanced Python features um, to try and give you like a nice, clean, easy to use API. I want to show you one that I'm not going to explain and show you another one and walk through and see what your level of interest is in, it, in understanding uh, an advanced language feature that might, give you, uh, that might give you great power. So the first one is declarative classes. If you've done Django stuff, you kind of recognize this pattern. Models. It's a class. It's got attributes that are instances of another class. Forms, it's a class. It's got attributes that are instances of another class. Model forms, same deal. Third party apps like TastyPy, same kind of looking API. You make a class. And I can just keep on going. Like Haystack indexes are built that way. Django sitemaps, the RSS framework. Everything kind of looks like that. And it's really weird because you're building declarative classes whose class attributes are instances of a related type. So you have models and they have model fields, forms with form fields. But the class that you get back, the object you get back by instantiating the class, doesn't actually look like the class that you defined at all. If you've done enough Python to know the difference between object level variables and class level variables, yeah, those, uh, those bits of code should weird you out a little bit. Made lots of class level variables instead of object level variables. What's going on? Python has this feature called meta classes. You can just totally change what it means to make an instance of a class. When you instantiate a class, instead of giving you an instance of my class, I can give you an instance of some other class. Just use your class for configuration, if I want to. And uh, that, that's deep, dark magic, right? It isn't. It's just a powerful language feature. It is deeper than we can go in the you know, 15 minutes that we have left. But it is within your grasp. Like, you can understand meta classes you could provide an application that uses like, that nice style of API. Let me show you something else that's a little easier, um, a little easier to grasp, and it's kind of cool too. Um, decorators. So getting rid of some complexity with decorators. If you've done a little bit of Django, like just a touch, you've probably seen there's a decorator called logged in, uh, or sorry, login required. So you can use the login required decorator just by putting, I added one extra line of code to my views. 
um, well, two. I imported the decorator, and then I said at login required just above my uh, home function, which is a view. So it's pretty cool. What it actually does is if you hit my page and you're not logged in, it'll send you off to the login screen and then bring you back. And if you are logged in, it just lets you see the view that you're on transparently. Really minimal effort on my part, right? I just put at login required. I don't really have to know how it works. Decorators are uh, kind of cool. Let's write a decorator that does something cool for us. So I'm going to move fast here. If, uh, if you haven't done like much functional programming with Python, if you haven't looked at decorators before, um, we'll see how we do. But I do have a blog post that's uh, you know, 12 easy steps to decorators. So it's really long. It's about as long as this talk. And if you haven't done decorators before, you could go read that talk. And uh, send me a question. Send me a comment if something's unclear to you. But simply, a decorator is just a function that takes a function and returns a function that will maybe be in place of the original thing. So here's the simplest decorator that I can think to write. I have a dictionary called library. I have a function called register. My function register takes a parameter that is called f. And f's name attribute becomes a key in the dictionary, and f becomes the value, and I return f. Anybody unclear about what the function register does? Just two lines of really simple code, right? Puts a name in a dictionary gives back whatever it was that got passed to it. OK, that is a decorator, it turns out. So I can say at register just before a function, and my function doesn't do anything. But that at register syntax is basically me telling Python, hey, my func, wrap it in this other thing and substitute whatever this other thing returns in the place of my func. And register returns the original function, so my func is totally unmolested, unmodified. But when Python runs this code, that library variable is going to end up with a key and a value. It'll be a function name and the actual function itself. It's a decorator. And it's actually useful because, hey, that's just what Django does. If you want to make your own custom template tags or filters, you can't call arbitrary Python functions in your templates because that might be insecure. It has to keep a list somehow. And it does it by using a, a decorator. Not magic, just Python. So let's make a useful decorator that doesn't come with a doesn't come with Django. Um, it turns out our views need to return a thing called a request context. And request context is pretty much there's a lot of variables that you want to see in your template, like who's currently logged in, for instance. We can just get those for free if we make a request context. And I can do that manually in my view. And it really kind of sucks. I have to add this third line to my render to response shortcut that says, yeah, I have a template. I have my variables. And then go make another dictionary full of variables called a request context and pull stuff out of the request to do that. It's an ugly line of code. Don't like that at all. Um, but we could use the render shortcut to automatically build a request context for us. You give the render shortcut the request and the template and your dictionary, and it does that request context thing for us. So that's better. But let's go one step further. And here's the code sample that might, be, that might make you think. So let's, let's take a minute on this code sample. Made a class called render, inherits from object. It has an init function. What's the, what's the init function on a class? Uh, more or less the constructor. It's not really the constructor, but yeah, uh, we mostly don't have to write constructors in Python, which is cool. We just have to write this initialization function. So this is what's going to be called automatically when I make an instance of my class. OK, and I'm expecting it to be passed a template. I'm just going to store the template on the object. We have that first mandatory parameter self the pointer to whatever the current instance of the object is. And then I have an underscore underscore call function. How about that? Any guesses about the underscore call function, what that does for me? Go for it. Yeah, so basically what I have to do is, is a decorator has to be a callable, which is a function. You can call functions, right? Turns out you can call objects too if you provide an underscore underscore call method. So you might know about magic methods, underscore methods. Python does its operator overloading thing by saying, hey, if you made a special function that's underscore underscore add, then you'd be able to use plus on your objects. If you made a special function called underscore underscore call, you'd be able to use two parentheses, the call operator, on the end. So I just made a class that will make callable objects. OK, so when you call this object, uh, you're going to pass it a function. And it's going to make a function called wrapper and give you back wrapper instead of the function that was passed in. 
Okay, so I am making a configurable decorator here. And whatever function gets decorated by this decorator is going to be replaced by wrapper. So what does wrapper do? Wrapper calls the original function, that's the self.function part. It passes it a request, and whatever else it got. Star args, star args is kind of Python's way of saying, hey, if there were more um, positional parameters coming into this function, then catch them in a variable that'll be a tuple. And star args, when I call the function, is Python's way of saying, you know, you've got a list of stuff, pass this as positional parameters or some other function. So it's a, it's a flexible function definition and calling piece of syntax, and you should totally have star and star star down cold. Um, and, and then it's going to do, hey, that's the Django part. The render, it has a request object, it has a template object, and it has a context. It got the context by calling the thing it wrapped around. So how would we use this? My view looks like this now. I have that at login required decorator like I did before. You can have as many decorators as you want. I have the decorator we just wrote. It's called at render. I pass it the template name, and now my view just has to return just the dictionary. The template name isn't inside of my function. The request doesn't have to be manually passed because my decorator kind of intercepts that and gets access to it. Um, quick show of hands. If you felt like, not that you could write this, but that you understand all the code that you just saw, the last two slides, let, let's see your hand. OK, so that's totally cool. Decorators are um, somewhere between intermediate and advanced Python. But let me just encourage you, this isn't magic. This isn't rocket science. It's not just for like special elite people that are going to like be language lawyers or something. If you take a piece at a time, decorators make sense. They use the built-in features language. Python supports closures, supports the star and the star star operator. You can define functions inside of functions. A few rules about scope and lookup. Not too bad, there's just a lot of moving pieces. Um, kind of the point of this is the, the decorator's cool. It made my code a little simpler. If I had a bunch of views, my code would be a lot simpler. But I get students that ask me all the time, you know, so how do I get better at Django? And I have three responses for you. Um, and the last one is maybe why you're here. Uh, the first response is just practice. You know, write some Django apps. The, the best thing is just to plunge in and do it. The second thing is you got to read the docs because the, the documentation for Django is awesome. There's a lot of them. You are going to have to read every link on the front page. Sorry about that. Start with the tutorial. We'll make things easy. But my answer number three is, hey, you're here. Get better at Python. Learn Python well. Um, Django doesn't have any magic. It just has Python and a few quote unquote advanced language features to make your life easier. It doesn't just have to make your life easier. You can you know, write a Django app and make my life easier as well if you understand Python well. Uh, come see us at marcano.com. Check out our uh, Tech TV YouTube channel. There's lots of free content about Django and Python and JavaScript and lots of other cool stuff. And that's it for my talk.